I'm in downtown Brooklyn, and this is the former Transit Authority headquarters. And you would never guess, but this nondescript building used to house more money than most banks. So when 600 grand went missing in the summer of 1979, surprisingly, not much of a fuss was made. But even more shocking is how the cash actually came to be taken. For Inside Edition Digital, I'm Sal Bono, and this is New York Green. This is the stuff that movie thrillers are made about. The late 1970s saw New York City in crisis. New York City in the late 70s was wild, and not in a good sense. The biggest issue by far was street crime, and that spilled into the subways. There was a widespread perception, and it was true. Crime was everywhere, and the city government was not doing enough to stop it. It was all over the place. What type of crime are we talking about? Was it murder? Was it uh, drug dealing? Was it just, you know, pickpocketing? It was all of the above. There was no greater symbol of the mess in the rotten Big Apple than the decaying subway system. Cars were breaking down constantly, so trains were short, trains were canceled. Graffiti was rampant on the train, and a symbolic that the system was out of control. Maintenance was deferred not just the trains, the stations, the system was just in horrible shape. 370 J Street is an ugly 13-story limestone building. It is truly institutional ugly. Inside, people hated to work there. There were 2,500 people who worked there for the MTA and the TA. The city, at the beginning of the 20th century, used to collect its receipts from the trains at all 472 stations and bring it to 370J Street at Willoughby. The trains used to stop, would be unloaded at 370, you walk through a long tunnel, up a few stairs and you're on the second floor near the money room. The money room was guarded by two guards. Of course, they had a desk where you had to get past you had two supervisors in the money room at all time. Each one had half of the code to the safes. Huge amounts of money going through that room. Take a day when there are four million riders. That's $2 million in revenue coming in every day from the subways alone. A lot of that money came in in coins or small bills as the fare rate. A lot of this stuff had to be counted and bagged and then shipped to the bank. That's why you had this whole big money room. This was the most heavily guarded room in America. It had a dedicated train, a money train, that drove right into the building. The money was put with armed guards on an elevator up just one floor, airtight, you know, like, like the highest security you could imagine. And the money train ran until 2006 when they transitioned to, uh, to Metro cards. It was a very simple and well thought out scheme. It had very little exposure to the public. And it worked, you know, until this. <laughs> the irony in all of this, the only thing that worked for them was how to get the money. Yep. So at the end of July 1979, when over half a million dollars went missing from a government agency that was constantly begging for money, it shockingly didn't enrage people the way one would imagine. These people were trying to do their day's work. On a Friday, they came in, they locked away the receipts of the day, usually 1.8, 1.9 million. On Monday, the same two guards come back and they find they're missing 600,000 in 60 bricks of $10 bills. Altogether, 120 pounds. And they leave in the safe 1.1 million of other denominations. $1 bills, tokens, $20 bills, $50 bills. But they take the $10 bills. In the context of all these really horrible things that were going on, the loss of $600,000 was really not big in the global sense. So people kind of forgot about it. It was, it was, a, it was not an armed robbery. Nobody got had a scratch. It was, it was kind of like, yeah, all right, it happened, but nobody was hurt, thank goodness. 
you got to think about the murder and the mayhem and all the rest of the stuff that was going on at the time. Put that into that perspective. Uh, I also think it was like just the sort of whole like laid back thing with the transit authority. It's like, eh, 600, eh, yeah, I mean, not, not a big deal. So what kind of heist was it? There are two kinds of heist. I'll let Mike from Breaking Bad here explain. Those where the guys get away with it those that leave witnesses. But how did the money get snatched? A notice went out late the week before, uh, just before the weekend, saying the building's power is going to be shut down, all the systems will be shut down. Also, of course, the alarm systems. This, I think, really opened a, a, a door, metaphorically, to this heist, which I'm sure had been in the planning stages for a long time. I don't know how many people knew about that so-called soft wall in the ladies' locker room, the most heavily guarded room in New York City. You gotta go through guys with guns to get into the room, and yet right next door you go into the ladies' locker room and you can literally crawl right through the wall into the money room. A planned power outage, no alarms, a so-called soft wall in the ladies' room? This sounds like a recipe for disaster. This is New York City Transit Authority. I make that point because it was quite autonomous. These guys were the subway guys, and they were all guys, very few women, of course, in those days. They pretty much did whatever they wanted to do, you, you know? I mean, it was like, it was an impenetrable agency. A couple of weeks before this incident, two guys get locked out of the money room. They were embarrassed. They tried every way to get in uh, to the code. Uh, they couldn't figure, you can only open it from inside. They finally went to the adjacent women's room and find a plate covering a hole in the wall. They take out the plate, it's a 20 inch hole. How does that go, un not only unnoticed, but also does that speak to the gender bias that there's a hole in the ladies' locker room? Was that hole initially there? How did it get there? And does that speak to just how much that room was not used? Probably speaks to all of that stuff, Sal. Um, first of all, like I said, I, I, I wasn't allowed to look at the money room. I didn't get to see the hole. What I learned was there was a repair made in this lady's locker room involving that wall. And it was, there was some pretty common knowledge around that, well, you know, that's a soft wall because <laughs> it adjoins the money room. I'm not sure anybody really talked about that, but I mean, people knew. The other thing is to your point about the gender bias. God forbid there might be a woman in there, you know? Oh, okay. So um, I, I think that had a lot to do with it. And the fact that, like I said, there's so few women working for the TA, it probably wasn't that used. The Transit Authority Police, the NYPD, and even the FBI all got involved to try and figure out what happened. They weren't that greedy. They could have taken hundreds of thousands of dollars more. They're for the taking, you know, no one's gonna disturb you. Uh, they could have worked all night loading that stuff out. It was well strategized. They knew exactly what they were doing. $10 bills are easy to pass off. But the question is, how did they get 120 pounds of $10 bills out of the building? And there are many theories about it. One of the theories is that they took it to the locker room, which was nearby, and they just split it up among themselves and carried it out. But there's another theory that they had help outside, and they just threw the money out of the window. Now, these are bricks of $10 bills. And even if you put it in a duffel bag, it's still heavy and would make a sound when it hit the ground. They feel that there was help outside and it could have been thrown out the window and no one saw it. I'm sure it happened pretty fast. These guys obviously were insiders uh, or they had total inside knowledge. They knew exactly what they had to do, how they had to get the stuff, how to take it out in those bags. I think it was like an in and out job. Nobody was the wiser until Monday morning when these two money room guys showed up and said, well, wait a minute, there's, there's a big hole over here where we had a stack of tens, you know? <laughs> so, Uh-oh. 
The ominous Brooklyn building where the crime occurred employed over 2,000 people, but just 700 employees were questioned and fingerprinted by authorities. Reports say one employee allegedly failed a lie detector test. However, it was not enough to make an arrest. It apparently was inside job. No one took the blame for it. The one person who did take a fall was the chief of the transit police, a man named Sanford Garlick. I knew Garlick from years ago. Sandy Garlick, who at one point was city council president when John Lindsay was mayor and also ran for mayor was never considered to be the brightest bulb. He was the first and highest ranking Jewish chief of inspectors. A sweetheart of a guy, you know, and a real crime fighter. He was played as a buffoon, but Sandy wasn't. He was nice, he was smart. Everybody loved him. This guy was basically a New York celeb, but he's from the Bronx. He lived a modest life. In 1980, Gerlick was relieved of his position in the Transit Authority by then-Governor Carey. I think you, Carey, was genuinely embarrassed and wanted to change it very quickly. But if anyone was going to be a model for Inspector Clouseau... I could ski before I could even crawl. It would have been Sandy Gerlick. He didn't know what was going on. He tells the reporter, I want to keep a low profile. Don't don't put me into the story. You're chief of security for the MTA. How do you keep out of the story? I want to keep a low profile. Really? He was very forthcoming with me. And he did say, I, I, I'm pretty sure I have a pretty good idea who did this. Uh, I can't prove it. And he, he took that secret to his grave. He lived to be like 93. Gerlich passed away in 2011. Just shortly after the cash went missing, money bags used by the New York Transit Authority were found at a New Jersey motel. What stands out to you about this crime? I would say that it was just kind of forgotten pretty quickly. Even I had to do some research on this before I uh, spoke to you. What stands out about this is how foolish people can be about their own vulnerabilities. I don't mean to get philosophical here, but how many stories have there been with, well, we warned him this might happen, you know, we told him that, you know. All in all, at the end, when you think about this story, it may be a movie thriller, but it's a movie thriller that's really a comedy. Over 40 years later, the case remains unsolved. <laughs>